Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Shreya Trapetti. I am so excited to kick off our new series on interprofessional education. You know, we only see snapshots of our patients in the clinic or in the hospital, and now there's such a growing emphasis on team-based care. But it fascinates me how little we know about the larger healthcare team, how little we get a chance to interact or understand the other team players in our patients' health. And I think that's where the beauty of podcasts come in. Podcasts can help us go places that we can't necessarily go in our day-to-day. And today, we're exploring home care, particularly focusing on home health aids. And helping me today on our podcast is Gabby Mayer. She does a lot of the behind the scenes work uh, with the Graphic Bites for Core IM. And you may remember her from the Stories of Women in Medicine episode. Thank you for having me join you. I'm so excited to be back behind the microphone and talking <laughs> about an equally important, but actually a very different topic. Yep. Uh, I do think this is going to be super practical and I hope eye-opening as an episode for some of you listening. It was definitely eye-opening for us. Um, and a- another thank you to ACP for sponsoring this episode for CME, particularly a huge shout out to Dr. Davrinchik for believing in this mission and huge kudos to all the work she's already done in this interprofessional education sphere particularly the compassionate care curriculum. Uh, We will link that in our transcript for the episode um, so you guys can check that out. Okay, let's set the agenda for today's episode. We're going to start off by going over why all clinicians should learn about home care workers. We'll touch upon their different scopes of practice. We'll touch upon how insurance actually plays a role in what coverage there is. And lastly, we'll talk about challenges that home care workers frequently face and give you some pearls for how to mitigate those challenges. Just a heads up, parts of this episode will be focusing on the American healthcare system. So for our friends in Canada, Australia, and other countries, listen in. We would love to hear from you on how home care or health systems are similar or different. And with that, let's dive in. Let's get started. You know, despite kind of being eyes and ears in the home, uh, most of the time, uh, home care workers, which include home health aides, personal care attendants, I find that actually they're actually invisible to the rest of the medical team. That's Dr. Maddie Sterling, a general internist and health services researcher at Weill Cornell Medical College. You know, as I was taking care of patients as a primary care doctor, I was studying um, heart failure readmissions and trying to understand, you know, what was driving this you know, a few years ago, along with everyone else. And patient after patient, you know, would talk to me about, you know, relying on caregivers in the home. And, you know, Dr. Sterling, why are you asking me about my medications? You know, my daughter is helping me with that. Or what do you mean, you know, cook a meal with low salt? Like my aide is taking care of that. And I think those questions or those statements from patients really made me as a researcher think really hard because I thought, you know, that's fascinating. I had never bothered to ask about who was helping you at home. And a second point is I had never bothered to ask the person in the waiting room to come join us. You know, at first when I was listening to Dr. Sterling, I actually felt a little bit guilty. I I started thinking to myself, had I been making a basic error with patient after patient by not checking in about whether they'd left a home health aide or a paid caregiver in the waiting room? But then I did a little more reflection and I I actually decided to let myself off the hook because quite frankly, I can't remember the last time that I was taught anything about this. I don't think it's the type of thing that gets covered in medical school or quite frankly, in nursing school. And then I think there is a knowledge gap in terms of the types of services the home health aid can provide, the difference between the skilled care that can be provided in the home through Medicare or not. The wealth of information that home health aides can provide. They are such an untapped resource. That's Anne Maria. She's been a case manager for about the last 30 years, working in large healthcare systems and now serving as senior leadership for New Jewish Home, which handles a lot of community-based programs, such as with home health aides. The idea is that you're trying to maintain this person in the community and either delay or avert the need for institutional care. The the goal of providing these long-term support services in the home is really to avoid the need for uh, having to go into a nursing home. And the thing is, keeping people in the home actually helps the larger healthcare system. There's some evidence to suggest that home health care can actually save health systems money. So for instance, there's a 2017 study that randomized patients to either be discharged from the hospital with or without home health services. And the group that had home health services intact 
save the healthcare system about $6,000, decrease their readmission rate, and actually had lower mortality numbers and outcomes. And this is in comparison, again, to that similar matched control patients who did not receive these services. Plus, as a bonus, this is a really big study. It was done in a large and diverse patient population with an N of 65,000. Nice. That is a nice bonus and plus A plus for generalizability. So it sounds like the larger health system is probably benefiting from these home services. Our patients are definitely using these home services. So we should probably be familiar with them. No, I agree. It, you know, so it's just like when I was on my psych rotation for medical school, I was actually required to attend AA meetings so that I could know what it was like. Should I ever recommend it to my patients? It's kind of like practicing what you preach. Right. But we can't even begin to navigate this if we don't know who the different health workers in the home are and how their roles differ. There's many different types of home care workers. Those types involve home health aides personal care aides, home health attendants, nurses' aides. Sometimes people include uh, nurse anesthetists in this uh, model. There's all different different types of workers. Yikes. There are so many. And the titles can get quite confusing and honestly made this episode a little difficult to research. What we found, for instance, is that two home care workers can have different titles, but very similar scopes of practice. Or on the flip side, Two home care workers can have the same title, but have a different comfort level with tasks based on what agency or state they trained in. And it doesn't help on top of that. The terminology is quite regional. So for instance, in New York, it, one can call someone a home attendant, but say you go to a different state like California, it's called an IHSS, an in-home support services. So the thing that helped me navigate this whole mess was thinking about it from the perspective of what tasks are done by each of these home care workers. And I'd say that this generally falls into three buckets of jobs that these individuals perform for their patients. I want to start with the group that has the narrowest scope of practice, and this is a group that is referred to as personal care assistants or home health attendants. Those are people who are doing maybe a little bit of shopping, a little bit of housekeeping, maybe the bathing, the feeding you know, sort of help with range of motion exercises and that type of thing. But generally, it's, it's personal care. I mean, there and companionship, which I think is is important. You know, they become often the you know the link to the outside world. The you know they they are part of relieving the social isolation. That is a really good point. I don't think that you can forget that these people also serve as company for some of our patients. Actually. I would like a home health aid because I could use some company (laughs) on my weekly grocery shopping trips. I think this would materially impact my quality of life in a good way. Yes, yes. I think my spouse is serving that role for me right now. (laughs) Um, I appreciate all that he does, by the way. Um, So next up is home health aides. Home health aides, they're trained to do all that personal care tasks uh, that home assistants do. So that bathing, feeding, groceries, home tasks. But home health aides have a little bit more medically oriented education. Home health aides usually typically have a larger scope of care. So they can do vital signs. They can do a little bit higher level. So for instance, they're trained to do blood pressure readings or routine ostomy care. But in talking to some of these home health aides in prep for the episode, even this varies by agency or state. So for example, say finger sticks, right? Not all home health aides were comfortable with finger sticks. And despite those variations though, there were some definite limits to know in terms of scope of practice. Generally, uh, they they do not administer medications. uh, And I think there's been a lot of discussion about expanding the scope of practice of home health aides to to maybe encompass more of that type of care um, since they are in the home. All right. So just to reiterate that common misconception, it would be incorrect for me to instruct a home care attendant or home health aid to give a patient medications. That's just not within their scope of care. Sure, they can remind a patient about their medications. Also, if the patient is self-directing, which essentially just means that they have capacity, home health aides can actually take pills out of the bottle and give them to the patient so long as the patient directs them to. Mm -hmm. So my takeaway here is that home health aides can't actually take over the whole process of administrating medications from start to finish. And that's like a similar thing, I guess, with other tasks, like, for example, Foley's. 
home healthies can change the Foley bags, but they can't insert or remove the Foley. So what ends up happening when your patient does need help with these skills? So if they need help with administering medications or inserting or removing Foley's. Right. So that's when you're going to consider referring the patient to skilled care. Skilled care encompasses nursing, physical therapy, speech therapy. But again, that's episodic. It, uh, it, the goal of it is really to address a short-term issue or to provide the education and skills to either the client that's being served or their caregivers to be able to, to continue the care uh, on a longer-term basis. I know, I know. It sounds probably a little weird hearing client, but that's how in some training programs patients are called. But what I took away from uh, from hearing this and reflecting on this is all the times that I've discharged patients with a quote-unquote safe plan. And I don't think I fully realized that skilled nursing services or therapy are probably only for just a few visits here and there and not necessarily a good long-term plan. Well, that's exactly why we're creating the podcast. I hope <laughs> yes. that we are filling some of these knowledge holes for a lot of other people too, because I, it's just so confusing. Um, speaking of confusing, let's solidify what we've talked about so far. So who are the who's who of home care workers? We're going to start with attendants. They have the smallest scope of practice. They handle essentially IADLs and a little bit of social support and company. Moving up to aides, they have a bit more medical training. They can do things like blood pressures, help with basic dressing changes. But that's with the caveat that whatever skills they have are super, super dependent on where you are in the country and even what agency your home health aide is working with. And then lastly, if we level up one more, we move into skilled nursing and PT, and that's for more advanced needs, and that's pretty much for anything beyond what a home health aide can offer. So we've talked a lot about different kinds of home care workers so far. For the remainder of this episode, we're going to focus specifically on home health aides and leave everybody else. Uh, behind. So the first question that I've been wondering is which of our patients can actually get home health aids and where does insurance factor into this? Ah, insurance. I know, I'm sorry. (laughs) Yes, I know, I know. So after researching this, I think I finally understand why the social worker who I really love gives me a deep sigh when I ask for a home health aid on rounds for a patient who say, is older, comes in with recurrent hypoglycemia from trouble eating because of his esophageal cancer. And I think, hey, you know, I think he could benefit from some help with uh, getting a puree diet and groceries and things like that. Okay. So she's giving you a deep sigh because this patient has Medicare and not Medicaid. Yes, you got it. (laughs) Pass the test. (laughs) Yes. I feel like I have a whole new understanding now of the back and forth that happens in multidisciplinary rounds. Now that I know the basics of what insurance actually covers for home health aids. So now the question is going to be, are you going to be getting less deep sighs when you are on the wards? <laughs> I know. I should do like a pre and post after this podcast. Um, but anyway, so let's go by insurance by insurance and start with Medicare. What does home health aid options look like for your patient who has Medicare? Medicare generally covers older adults uh, above the uh, 65 years and older uh, and younger disabled. Medicare pays for what we call skilled nursing care in the home. So this is episodic care. Uh, It does not pay for long-term home health care. So if somebody is leaving the hospital and requires wound care or um, ongoing uh, but short-term medication management or physical therapy, so it's a pretty limited benefit. And during that episode, uh, the home care agency can determine that there's a need for a home health aid. Uh, the hours that get approved generally don't uh, extend beyond 20 hours a week. And once that episode of skilled nursing care ends, the coverage for the home health aid ends also. Ah, so that's why so many patients who are older say that they have a home health aid for three hours, for six days a week, or for four hours, for five days a week, or something to that effect. Yes, but the caveat here is that this stuff is always changing, and so those numbers might also change by the time this podcast comes out. I really hope not, but you never know. (laughs) Um, To recap, because that was a lot of information, when we're talking about our Medicare patients, home health aids are provided for patients who have demonstrated a need for something called skilled care. This means that under Medicare, you can't get a solo home health aid. The aid needs to come alongside its skilled nursing need, like IV antibiotics, injections, wound vat care, or some other form of skilled therapy. 
And once that patient's skilled need ends, so does a home health aide. There's also one more important thing to mention, which is that there's a second criterion. It gets even more complicated. So not all Medicare patients who need skilled services are actually eligible for home health care. To get covered, your patient must be considered homebound. And to that point, I think I have signed off on so many forms without really understanding how Medicare defines homebound. So homebound doesn't necessarily mean that the patient can't leave the home at all. It just means that they require some significant amount of assistance to leave. So they can still go to dialysis or a church if that's important to them, but it requires a considerable and taxing effort. We will link the exact definition in the infographic and our show notes. Okay, so homebound doesn't actually mean homebound. Can we just say this is so counterintuitive and I am so appreciative and grateful to the social workers and the case managers in my life who are navigating this so much better than I am. Yes, much love. So let's move on to Medicaid. Medicaid usually have to meet an income requirement below the federal poverty line. And so the thing to know about Medicaid is that unlike Medicare, Medicaid actually covers home health aids for more patients and for longer periods of time. Really, Medicaid becomes the primary payer for that long-term care uh, in the home uh, pro- that is provided by home health aides. But to receive long-term home health services, you actually can't just have any old kind of Medicaid. You need to have this particular kind of a plan called a managed long-term care plan, which you might sometimes hear abbreviated as an MLTC. In the biz, depending on what state you're in, but yes, if you're in New York City, do drop that on rounds. People now who require uh, long-term support services in the home are required to enroll in what's called a managed long-term care plan. There's an enrollment process that somebody has to go through to get into a managed long-term care plan, uh, which could you know, take several weeks. So once a person gets into the managed long-term care plan, it then, they, they are assigned an interdisciplinary care team, which includes a nurse and a social worker, and that the plan will make the determination uh, as to how many hours need to be authorized. Let's recap this whole process so far to make sure that we're on track. So your patient wants a home health aid. In order to get that, they're going to have to enroll in a special insurance called a long-term care plan. So once you have that insurance on board, that's when you can actually submit a request for home health care. And at that point, there's a certified home health agency, which goes by the acronym CHHA or the very fun CHA, uh, that's going to go to the patient's home, evaluate them, and then it's going to say to insurance, yes, this need is justified. They do need a home health aid or no, this is probably not a good fit. And this CHA and that justification is what's going to ultimately determine if your patient will be covered and if they're going to qualify for home health care or not. Oh my gosh, that is a lot of form filling and red tape just to get an aid at home to help with groceries. Uh, A lot. And as a small aside, I actually didn't know what cha was until this episode. I'd heard a lot of social workers on round say, oh, I'm going to refer Mr. J to a cha, or I would read that in their notes. But now it makes sense that that was a referral to a certified home health agency to assess the patient's needs. Have I mentioned that I'm grateful to social workers yet? Because I really, (laughs) really am. This was really hard to research. Um, Speaking of which, I think any of our social work friends would point out that while we're talking about a lot of patients with Medicare and Medicaid, we actually haven't covered all of our patients. Because remember, Medicare is for, in broad strokes, for the elderly and Medicaid is for those under a certain income. And then also a few other populations of patients like pregnant people, disabled people, And so the big question that follows is going to be, what if a patient isn't eligible for Medicare or Medicaid? Where do these patients fall in the insurance paradigm? If if the person does not have Medicaid and does not qualify for Medicaid, then the options become, uh, does this person have a long-term care insurance policy or can they privately pay? So in other words, what Anne is saying here is that if there's no way to get Medicaid on board, then some proactive patients may have already paid into a special type of insurance, which is called private long-term care insurance. And now if they don't have the ability to do that, which means that we have no insurance on board at all, then your patient is going to turn to paying out of pocket to the private home health care market. 
if you are going to go through a licensed agency to hire a home health aide, it would probably cost you in the neighborhood of about $28 an hour. If you're going to hire, uh, you know, through what's called the gray market, which is people who, you know, are in the community and do this work, you might be paying something like $15 an hour. The benefit of going through a licensed agency is that the home health aid that you would be that would be coming into your home has been, uh, you know, their background has been checked. They are required to receive certain levels of training, uh, an ongoing training. They're supervised by uh, a nurse, and in the event that that person can't come today, the agency, you know, can dip into their their staffing and supply somebody else so that you have coverage. All right. That was a lot. So the method person me thinks we should solidify this clearly. Gabby, will you play along with a little bit of Socratic method with me? I am the only other person in the room, so I think I am obligated Noted. to say yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for playing along. I appreciate you being a team sport. Also, shout out to Dr. Hadass Rice and Dr. Irene Sponenberger, uh, for which the inspiration behind some of the questions I'm going to ask you came from. So let's, and listeners also kind of pause it and think about the kind of solidifying what you learned also along the way. So let's say uh, you have a 72-year-old male who uh, has a family who's living on the other side of the country and has had worsening vision. And now he is deemed blind. He requires five pills a day with his chronic other medical conditions, and he's asking for a home health aid. So on rounds, are you going to bring up he needs a home health aid, a home attendant, a skilled home care nurse? Okay, so let's think. So first of all, agree. I think he does need help in the home. So it sounds like a good idea. I I think for me, the big question is, can this patient be self-directing or not? Because if I recall correctly, if he can't be self-directing, then he would really need something more like a skilled nursing to help him. But if he is self-directing, then yes, I do think he could get a home health aide who would be able to hand him his pills um, as long as he's able to sort of verbalize that he needs them. Okay. Right. So the teaching point there is the home health aides usually can't administer the medications uh, unless the patient is self-directing. Great. So then what if the patient is self-directing and the patient's insurance is Medicare? Okay. So I remember that because I just said it not too long ago (laughs) that for Medicare, you need to have two big criteria. So the first is you need to be deemed homebound. And the second is you need a skilled need. So for that first criteria, yeah, I, I think you wouldn't intuitively say he's homebound, but he's blind and he might actually need help leaving the home. It might be considerable and taxing as an effort. So check on that box. And then as far as the skilled need, based on what you've told me, I don't hear that he has a skilled need. And so I would say that Medicare is not really going to be an option for him for home health services. Right. I would agree. So then what would be that patient's other options? So he could opt to get Medicaid. Again, I don't know if he would qualify, but if he does, the caveat here is this is going to take a couple of weeks um, and he might need the services sooner. And if that's the case, then he'd really be looking at the private market. So either going directly to a home health agency and saying, hey, I would like to employ somebody or just going into the community and finding somebody who uh, can work in his home. home. Awesome. Five stars, Gabby. Five stars. (laughs) I am sweating. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry for putting you on the hot seat. All right. So let's say we jump through all the logistical hoops to get our patient a home health aid covered by their insurance. All right. Now we're cooking. Yes. But it is not the end of the story. So many of the home health aides we talked to in preparation for the episode talked about how much they love their jobs. You know, really, really um, for, for 18, 20 years have been doing this profession. But they were also very honest about their struggles. And I think it's really important to openly talk about these pain points in our healthcare system. I mean, Dr. Sterling's done extensive research on home health aides, and she's also been surprised in some of the things that she's found. For starters, home health aides don't exactly know what kind of medical or psychosocial issues that are going on on the other side of the door. Home care workers are actually not told what diagnosis the patient has before they're assigned to the job, which I find fascinating and scary for both the worker and the patient. So imagine walking into a home in the Bronx and you're going to take care of somebody and you don't know what disease they have or why you're being assigned to them. 
you're then in the home trying to figure that out. And the patient may be cognitively impaired. There may or may not be a family member around. And some of this is because of HIPAA and, and older policies where that information wasn't shared with the worker. But it's sort of ironic because this person is now going to be involved in some of the most intimate you know, details of this patient, bathing them, showering them, getting their meals cooked. And, and actually, they have no clue what disease uh, from the get-go. Can I just say that a game of hidden diagnosis feels like such a crazy way to practice any kind of healthcare? I agree. And some of the aides um, in, in other papers have cited that they've arrived to patients' home finding that the, the patient didn't have a lift or other necessary equipment, or the patient suffered from dementia or was physically or sexually aggressive. Oh my goodness. That is really heavy. Yeah. So, so my question is, does the home health aide have any kind of information on what's going on medically with the patient or are they going in completely blind to what's happening? Yeah. So, well, sort of, right? So if you ever helped a patient initiate home health services, you might recall that clinicians have to sign off on these quote unquote plans of care. And those are created by nurses who evaluates the patient in the home. These are unfortunately very long documents that insurance is required to fill out. If you've ever seen one, you will definitely remember. Um, but what doc Dr. Sterling tells us from her research is that parts of these care of plans get lost in translation. As a primary care doctor, we're often signing home care forms, right? These need to be, the visiting nurse goes into the home when, a, when it's deemed that a patient has a need, skilled need. We as the doctor sign the form. The form that we sign is very different. That care plan is very, very different in appearance and detail than the one that actually ends up in the home. And medications and their indication aren't always on there. So if a patient has a side effect, you know, how are you supposed to know what that's for or why? And so it's very interesting because the level of detail actually never makes it um, into the person that's supposed to be overseeing what's happening. So we asked in one of our studies for the aides from all different agencies across the city to bring in the care plan that they see on the refrigerator. And actually, if I had to use that care plan, I would not know what to do for a patient, even with my medical background. So where does the information get lost in the system? The experts, including home healthies themselves, weren't necessarily sure, but Dr. Sterling gave us her best guess. It could vary by agency, but often what happens is that this sort of generic, more generic sort of called care plan or plan of care ends up in the home. And, and so I imagine that that more detailed plan is sitting at the home care agency as it should. But as you'd imagine, when an aide is in the field, they don't always have access to what's at the agency, which may be in a different borough or a different location. And on top of that, if the home health aide did have a question or run into a problem, sometimes they can't even get a hold of their supervisor or someone at the agency. This has both been cited in a bunch of studies that sometimes home health aides will have to call three, four, or five times to even get a hold of someone or get an answer. Now, let's say that this isn't an issue and that a home health aide actually does have access to the detailed care plan. The trick here is that the training isn't always going to be standardized and it may not meet the needs that they're encountering on the other side of the door. So let's take a step back. So most home health aides will get trained at the federally mandated uh, 75 hours of training. Um, and that is a lot of hours, but a lot of that focuses on more general information like infection control, transferring patients, how to deal with harassment. It doesn't address anything more disease specific? A lack of disease specific training has been shocking to me. And more recently, there have been programs to train um, home care workers in certain conditions. I study congestive heart failure. And here in New York City, this is a condition where home care workers are, are utilized frequently. Um, there really have not been formalized training programs on the disease. And so if you think about a scenario where an, an aide may be placed in a home and not know what condition the patient has, and then they also haven't received formal training, that could be a problem. You might not be able to observe what you're supposed to be observing, triage, uh, how you might if you were trained. Now, some home health aides we talked to did say they received some disease-specific training on, say, signs of hypoglycemia or signs of stroke, which I think is great. But on hearing this, 
I think maybe some of these things can be addressed, say, in our clinic visits and asking the patient if they're okay having the home healthy come in the room too. And this is essentially like killing two birds with one stone, right? Because a lot of home health aides say that when they hear the doctor or the nurse educate the patient, first of all, the home health aides themselves actually get the education and then they can go home with the patient and reinforce whatever the clinician said. Yeah. Bonus points there. But there is one thing to keep in mind if you do bring the home health aide into the room. They may not always feel comfortable speaking up there can be quite a large power dynamic implicitly present in the room. I think what I've learned from the home care workforce is it's it's a really vulnerable population. And so, you know, majority women, minorities, foreign born may have erratic employment, minimum wages. And so something to note is that sometimes these like family, you'll see this in the exam room. If you bring in, we, we see this all the time, you bring in a patient and you have a failing caregiver or an aide or whatever, and you're asking a patient, you know, are you taking your blood pressure medicine? And the aide and the patient's saying like, yes, of course. And then the aide is like behind them whispering, (laughs) no, but they don't want to, because they don't write, they don't want to look, they don't want to, a lot of the times we see they don't want to have a conflict with someone who's kind of employing them, not really employing them. It's the agency who is, but, um, You can imagine that to avoid conflict, like they're not going to want to always go against the patient um, for fear of maybe losing a job. So there's like these very delicate dynamics going on that different from family dynamics. Okay. Just to point out one thing, it is PCP gold when there is collateral information right there in the room for you. I just want to point that out. It is it is gold and silver and platinum. It is all of the precious metals. <laughs> but but also it's really important. I just want to pull one other thing that Dr. Sterling set out, which is I'm, I'm just a really big fan of naming unseen, unspoken forces in the room. Now, I will also say that how to navigate that is a whole other conversation. It's going to take another podcast to unpack that. But leaving this, I'm actually thinking about these forces and their clinical impact. And those power dynamics actually came up when talking to home health aides in preparation for the episode. While they were happy to talk to us and share information, they were afraid of the implications of having their voices and names on air. And so the last pain point that Dr. Sterling pointed out was that home health aides actually don't have agency over continuity of care for their patients. When patients get hospitalized, it's not guaranteed that they're going to go home and get the same caregiver they had before. And so for this reason, some home health aides have felt that they're just interchangeable or low-skilled employees and not the essential members of a care team. I think from one can say, okay, from a logistical perspective, it can be understandable, right? Depending on the duration of the patients in the hospital, an aide may be without work for days to week waiting, right? Yeah, but on the flip side, from a continuity of care perspective, I would imagine that knowing and working with a patient for a long period of time means that that home health aide is going to be able to pick up on really subtle but important changes. And we know this is really an issue of importance when we're talking about our uh, patients with cognitive impairment because those changes are even more subtle and even more important. So I can see the flip side. So clearly there are still some kinks to work out before we can optimize the environment where we're delivering home health to our patients, but I am a perpetual optimist and I promise you there is hope. Um, So let's close this episode by giving you a few actionable pearls so that when you go back into your workplace, you can better collaborate with your home health aides. The first big pearl is education. So hopefully you feel now that we're nearing the end of this podcast that you've done some work towards that goal by listening to us talk about this. (laughs) Yay! Hopefully you are still awake and with us. Um, But the biggest pearl that I want to impart on you all is not just to educate yourself, but when you go back to work, educate your front desk staff, educate the other members of your practice, and then most importantly of all, educate your patients because they may not actually know what kind of a role home health aides can play in their care. Because of the knowledge gap and you know, because of the pressures that people are under when they're operating, providing care in the community, so 
sometimes the conversations just don't happen. Being able to explain the kinds of things that a, a home health aide or, or help in the home could provide. And and also reminds us not just to talk and close these knowledge gaps, but to be proactive when having these conversations. So when you're considering whether a patient may need these services, start early. To actually become enrolled in, in a managed long-term care plan, it could take several weeks, four to six weeks. Somebody has to come and do an assessment. So it might not necessarily happen overnight. So that's the other thing is to really be sort of anticipating in advance, you know, sort of be thinking about these things proactively. If somebody's functional status is declining, if their cognitive status is declining, if you can see the stress that family members who might be bringing, you know, their their mother or their father or their, their family member in for services. And while I think this is a really important takeaway, I also want to acknowledge that this is so much more easily said than done, which is why Anne highlights the importance of also leaning on interprofessional colleagues who might be able to do some of this lifting alongside us. And then lastly, I think one of the most valuable pieces of advice that Dr. Sterling gave us was simply to remember the fact that our patients are not islands. They probably have people supporting them at home. I think the first step for any clinician would be to simply acknowledge the fact that there are probably a number of people in the home that are helping the patient, um, whether that's with personal care or medically oriented care, and re- and just ask them. And take the time. It's a simple question that could be incorporated into the social history. You know, who is who is helping you at home? Um, is there anyone that helps you get your medications? Is there anyone that brought you here today? Um, is there someone I should bring into the exam room? But of course, when you do get that home health aide in the room with you and the patient, it's really important to make sure to check in with them and see what additional perspective or that PCP gold they might be able to provide you. These are people, uh, once they are in place, who are with this person all the time, every day, you know, able to pick up on cognitive decline, functional decline, uh, depression, uh, non-adherence to the care plan. I don't know how often that treasure trove of information is really tapped into. Yes, treasure troves of information indeed. And so to round out this episode, it seems like the home care world and the medical world operate in silos, rarely interacting in a meaningful way, which is unfortunately to everyone's disadvantage. And yes, bridging these two worlds is complicated and involves spending time everyone's precious resource of the day. A thoughtful system has yet to help these two worlds collaborate. I don't think there's just any silver bullet and we're probably not going to solve this longstanding issue on the podcast today. But I think similar to patient care, the better we quote unquote hand off patients to home care and create a communication channel to home care and back to us, the better the system can work for our patients. And lastly, this is a team sport. So hopefully This episode made you reflect a little bit more on how to better communicate and work with your larger interprofessional team. And that is a perfect segue. So this episode was part one of four in our interprofessional education series. Our upcoming episodes are going to be looking at other crucial interprofessional roles, such as social workers, case managers, subacute rehab staff. So the ask here is if you know any people in any of these roles who would want to chat with us and come on air, please let us know. I promise we're really nice. We have a lot of fun. (laughs) My grandma thinks I'm really nice. (laughs) Um, You can reach us if you are interested in putting us in touch with anyone. Um, Reach us, please, over any of the Core IM social media accounts, or you can just reach us at our individual Twitter handles, which are on the Core IM website. Also, if you have any ideas or want to help produce any episodes on interprofessional education or health systems around the world, I am always open to working with anyone with a strong work ethic and attentive to details. So shoot us an email at hello at coreimpodcast.com. And if you like this episode, be sure to share this with your team or your colleagues. We will also link uh, on our website, the CME with ACP. And as always, a big thank you to our peer reviewers, Dr. Amy Shaw, Dr. Harry Sag, social worker Marlena Orme, as well as Dr. Ryan Chippendale. Props to Dr. Amy O and Gabby Meyer for the graphic, as well as Dr. Vicki Caspidis for uh, the meticulous website, and also to Arya Melikin for the astute audio editing. And as always, let's continue the conversation online on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
um, at our Core I Am podcast page or email us directly. We'd really appreciate feedback. What are we doing right? How can we improve? And if you enjoyed listening to the show, give us a review on iTunes or whatever podcast app you use. It really does help people find us. And as always, opinions are expressed on this podcast are our own and do not represent opinions of any affiliated institutions. You deserve a tech career you love. Coworkers you can count on. Innovation you're proud to build. If you're ready to change the world through technology, explore a career at Cox. Make a real impact in engineering, development, cybersecurity, and more. All while experiencing work-life balance, flexible work options, and great benefits. Visit cox.career slash tech to find a job you love today. That's cox.career slash tech. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply.